in the beginning, there is always the music. One of the coolest, savviest themes in TV history. Then, there are the murders. And always, always, there is the man, Mason. Perry Mason. Or is it a man named Raymond Burr? There's no great mystery here, no crime, just an ongoing conspiracy between two strong central characters. Call it the case of the courtroom legend. Did Mrs. Bowles have anything to do with the murder? No. I did it alone. I killed him in that apartment I rented. Figured it out all by myself. It's a formula that doesn't flinch. A legal practice made perfect by repetition on television alone for the past 32 years. Your Honor, I think that's enough, Mr. Mason. The case against Evelyn Bagby is dismissed. Thus began actor Raymond Burr's portrayal of Perry Mason on CBS in September 1957 in the case of the restless redhead. Three decades later, his appearance has certainly changed. But he's still Perry Mason, rusty or not. In this film, fittingly titled Perry Mason Returns, America's most revered defender of justice comes back to the courtroom in the first of 12 TV movies that will be featured on Showtime. You never told me that Perry Mason was going to be her attorney. You knew all about her. Who'd you think she was going to get, Nixon? Indeed. When someone is falsely accused of murder, who better than Perry could ever handle the case? I've been trying to think who should represent you. The best man I can think of is me. And who better than Raymond Burr could take on this role? I'm doing something I believe in. And I believe in it more today than I did yesterday. In Denver, on the set of the 10th and most recent Perry Mason movie, The Case of the Lethal Lesson, Raymond Burr, at age 71, makes it clear he's defending more than just the accused in his legendary role. And I believe in our system, our quality of justice. We're imperfect in our system because it's run by human beings and administered by human beings. It's still the best one in the world. Isn't it true that murder was going to be the solution to all your problems? You'd have the money, the girl, and no one would ever know. He believes he's Perry Mason when he's doing it. He honestly believes it, I'm sure. Living the part of Perry Mason as he does, he knows more about it than the writer does. In fact, I think he knows more about it than uh, if Earl Stanley Gardner were alive today. <laughs> Earl Stanley Gardner, the Oxnard, California lawyer who created the Perry Mason character, was born 100 years ago. He considered himself a misfit early in his legal career, but he achieved stunning popularity with his fiction. The Case of the Velvet Claws, published in 1933, was the first of 82 Mason novels Gardner would write or even dictate before he died in 1970. The name, Perry Mason, apparently derived from the publisher of a magazine Gardner read as a boy. The stories derived from Gardner's fictional image of himself and his ideal of a lawyer as Puritan hero. He was a great trial lawyer and would have been, had he not gone into writing, probably the greatest trial lawyer in, in the world. In 1934, Gardner's creation was brought to life on film by actor Warren Williams in The Case of the Howling Dog. Five more Perry Mason movies would follow, with actors Ricardo Cortez and Donald Woods also in the leading role. In 1943, Perry Mason debuted on radio, lasting 12 years on CBS. Perry Mason, defender of human rights, champion of all those who seek justice. John Larkin, one of four different actors in the lead, would later guest star on some of the television episodes. When CBS and Earl Stanley Gardner decided to bring Perry Mason to TV in 1956, they auditioned scores of hopefuls for the title role. Raymond Burr, already a veteran actor at age 39, came to audition for two parts, Perry Mason and the hapless prosecutor, Hamilton Berger. Earl Gardner watched the auditions on film. Maybe he just got tired of watching all of that film on people because when he saw me, he decided that I was the one that should be pulling Perry Mason. And um, so he said, that's the man I want. Exactly why? I haven't the slightest idea. And 
Passion? Your Honor. Born near Vancouver, Raymond Burr was raised in Northern California. His parents separated when he was six years old. At age 12, he was chubby and felt mistreated. This left him especially sensitive to the problems of children. Of wearing glasses or having a cleft palate or being fat or being skinny or any of those things. Because you're persecuted not only by the children but by the adults. You're put in a special place in class, in a classroom. Uh, I, I went to a military school. I could outride everybody in the school. But I destroyed the symmetry of the line, so I was never allowed to be in the cavalry. Uh, which was kind of sad. A few years later, Burr went to work on a ranch in New Mexico for 25 cents an hour. He still proudly recalls his triumphant return home. My mother and sister were there to meet me, and neither one of them recognized me. Because I'd lost all the weight, and I was... Uh, a uh, very, very dark brown. By the time he won the Perry Mason role, Raymond Burr was a handsome, broad-shouldered performer who stood six foot two on a solid platform of experience, Broadway, TV, and radio drama, and some 90 movie roles. He had co-starred with everyone from Elizabeth Taylor to Godzilla, and he was probably best known for his work as the wife murderer in Hitchcock's Rear Window and as the relentless prosecutor in A Place in the Sun. His life was also remarkable for its burden of tragedy. By the age of 38, he had already been widowed twice, losing his first wife in a wartime plane crash and his third wife to cancer. A second marriage had ended in divorce. And in 1953, Burr's only child, Michael, had died of leukemia. Ironically, the actor would soon be earning his fame portraying a character, Perry Mason, who had no life outside his work. No family, no friends, no home. Raymond Burr is reluctant to talk about his personal life. It's unlikely he will ever write an autobiography. I've been offered $2 million, and it's the easiest $2 million I ever turned down. Never be one for me. There may be some unauthorized things, and they won't know. They just won't know. Perry! Perry! Mr. Mason to you! Perry! knows just what to do! Perry! This rap song, created by crew members on the set of the Mason TV movies, suggests the camaraderie that binds Raymond Burr and his professional family. In fact, these sets are home away from home for Burr, who last year spent only 26 days at his California wine country estate. Here he's a demanding but caring father figure. I think you pay attention to what could go wrong with a show, as well as you pay attention to what could go wrong with... Um, if you had eight children, or eight relatives, or eight close friends living with you. Raymond is the um, sort of uh, sterner uh, member of the, of the cast. Barbara is the, is the one who was the mother. As Della Street, faithful assistant to Perry Mason, actress Barbara Hale has been part of the Perry Mason saga since the very beginning. This is Della Street, Perry Mason's office. Did you send a girl over here this afternoon? Well, it's it's just been a wonderful experience, a joy, a way of life. Thank you very much. Oh goodness, we've been together for so many years. He's he's part of our family, Raymond, and uh, I hope I'm part of his. But it's been a long and some might say lonely road for Della and Perry. Their relationship has been strictly business for 32 years. The only love in this law office has been the love of justice. It's a platonic pattern set in stone long ago by Earl Gardner's books. We weren't allowed to kiss or dance or be alone when we went out to dinner. Uh, because that just didn't happen in any of the books. And that was probably right, to, you know, to do. However, it was constricting because neither of us went with anybody else. You know. Young ladies and students that I've talked to over the years uh, love the relationship, and they're they're very content, very happy with their employer, and they see the the communication and uh, the business love. Let me put it that way. Uh, that. Della has with Perry 
And the others think, hmm, hard telling what goes on after office hours. And that's audience, you know. That's nice. It's not an easy, easy thing to uh, accomplish these kind of relationships. Half the audience wants you to be together and half the audience wants it to be a secret. I don't know if I've mentioned it, but it's nice seeing you again. These days, the scripts do allow more displays of tenderness between Perry and Della. The only trouble is, just as we sense that there may finally be some sparks between secretary and boss, an old flame appears from Mason's past. Perry! Across a crowded room, no less. As always, you look wonderful. So do you. This film, The Case of the Lost Love, is unique in the Perry Mason saga because for the first time it presents evidence that the lonely lawyer has not been celibate all these years. That lost love was before Della Street and Perry Mason met, so that was allowable. Maybe so, but the plot gives actress Jean Simmons a chance to pry into Perry and Della's long-running secret. What about you and Perry? I mean... <laughs> all right. Perry and I have... Good. I see you two are getting reacquainted. And uh, I... nothing is ever really said. And uh, what do you think? Do you think that uh, Perry and Della are going to get together? <laughs> I always used to joke about it and say, well, the end result, if Perry and Della got married, Della would retire, and then you wouldn't have her in the show. Raymond Burr and Barbara Hale preside over the Mason stories like proud parents. And now they have a new child, Hale's real-life son, actor William Catt. He plays Detective Paul Drake Jr. in nine of the recent TV movies. This afternoon is soon enough. People do this kind of thing for you often? All the time. Hmm. Don't even have to buy anything. Behind the scenes, another second-generation Masonite is director right Christian back. Nyby the second. Twenty-five years ago, his father directed yeah. Mason TV episodes. The director has to be as prepared as uh, Ray. And if he is, you get along fine. If he isn't, watch out. Don't get near Ray then. <laughs> the only thing I uh, uh, caution him about is uh, Ray's practical jokes, <laughs> which he's full of, yeah. you know. He's... Like, he's uh, well, he bricked up uh, Bill Tallman's dressing room, uh, the whole front of it. Bricked, I mean brick and mortar. And uh, he did that during the night. He uh, he filled Barbara's uh, dressing room full of balloons one time and uh, put a bunch of chickens in there another time. He, he did, you know, a lot of uh, weird things. The one thing about Mason that was good was the overall quality of the people that were in the show, behind scenes and, and, and in front of scenes, and the friendships that we walked away with after those years. It's a family. It's a family. And no one wants to leave their family. One former member of the Perry Mason family was actor William Tallman, who portrayed Mason's rival, Prosecutor Hamilton Berger. You gave the weapon to Lieutenant Tragg yourself. Lieutenant Tragg took it from me. In any case, I am not the defendant. It seemed a rather unfair rivalry, since, as everyone knows, Mason never lost a case. I'll object to that, Your Honor. Or did he? Jim Davidson, a super fan who is president of the National Association for the Advancement of Perry Mason, knows the true facts. There are two murder cases uh, that he lost. One was the case of the terrified typist during the first season. Uh, the second one was the case of the deadly verdict, which was a few seasons later. And then there were two civil cases that he lost, the case of the witless witness and the case of the dead ringer. In The Terrified Typist, Berger believes he has finally triumphed over his adversary. Defendant is remanded to custody of sheriff. Court stands adjourned. In the end, though, Mason's so-called loss is reversed. They were qualified losses at any rate. Again, Mr. Gardner wasn't writing any books that had any losses. His people didn't want to read about losses. However, we did one. We got about 30,000 letters that week saying, please don't ever do that again, you know. In real life, actor Bill Tallman grappled with his own messy legal case. He was at a party in March of 1960, and the party was raided by the, uh, the sheriff's um, deputies from the sheriff's office. And... Um, 
they found marijuana on the present pre premises, and um, they also found the guests running around naked. It was a big shock to me. It was impossible for him to have done any of the things they said he did. He wasn't even a member of the party. It was a duplex, and he, he was upstairs. And he came down, he happened to open the door. And they tied him in immediately with the party. However, before Tallman had a chance to clear himself, the network dropped him from the show. The fact that he'd been accused of something, and now that you know, we were doing a show based on American justice, you know, and there was no justice for that poor man at all. But eventually, after several months, when the case came to trial, the judge threw the case out for insufficient evidence. He thought that the police had no business um, interfering with a, a private party. Uh, Tallman was uh, reinstated by CBS once the charges were dropped and continued on until the end of the series. Bill Tallman died in 1968. In many of the new movies, David Ogden Stiers of MASH fame portrays Mason's new rival, prosecutor Michael Reston. Objection! No relevancy. Mr. Mason is harassing and humiliating this witness. All kinds of guest stars turn up as suspects on Perry Mason. In the old episodes, you can often spot up-and-comers like Robert Redford, Angie Dickinson, and Clint Eastwood. The final show in 1966 features Dick Clark as a suspected killer. Well, why would I want to kill Barry? Why? Even Perry Mason creator Earl Stanley Gardner got into the act. Court stands adjourned until 2 o'clock this afternoon. A judge was a fitting role for Gardner, since his Paisano production company produced the Mason series, and he controlled the creative decision. I think he was impatient with imperfection, and he was impatient with people who didn't do their jobs. I am the same way. Uh, I'm impatient with myself. And Burr was also frustrated with Gardner's insistence on the one-dimensional personality of his Perry Mason character. I would have liked to have seen him with some parents or some relations. I would have liked to have seen Della Street. And all of us should have had families one way or the other, or friends. People don't live the way that Perry Mason does. Yet the Mason character and shows, both old and new, continue to be enormously popular. Why? He's a knight in shining armor. He's the kind of guy that, that people respect and look up to and is always there when when people need him. Davidson claims the series is historically important, too. It was the first filmed weekly drama uh, with continuing characters. And uh, it was a, a very difficult show to produce. Um, it, they had a back-breaking schedule. And uh, when they started, uh, they, they were told that that it wasn't possible, and yet they did it. But the weekly grind would consume Raymond Burr's life for nine years. So hours were so long that he had to live in a bungalow on the set. Even though he had a home in Malibu, he, he was only able to go out there on weekends. Um, so it was a very heavy burden for him to carry. But the burden did bring fame and fortune. Burr reportedly was earning one million dollars a season by 1965, then a record salary for a TV actor. It enabled him to buy his own island in the South Pacific and to gain respect as a philanthropist. But it did cost him in other ways. If I had stopped the Perry Mason show, or stopped being in it when I wanted to do that, I would probably be father of six or seven children, or three or four today, and I am not. That's my biggest failure, was just not saying no. You know, I said, I don't think I'm going to, and I don't want to, and I should have stayed there. The world would have gone on without Perry Mason. I would have gone on doing other things. Burr, of course, did go on, after nine years of Perry Mason, to eight more years as TV's Ironside. While some might call the actor a workaholic, he views much of his work over the years as a personal mission. There's a lot of things you can do in life uh, if you're in our business that is good for the country and is good for your fellow man with no great problems to yourself in doing it. I like to be on the plus side of, of having had a reason for being here in the first place. And that's about it. 
I let God take care of a lot of my problems, and I try to take care of some of his. That is the truth, is it not? So even if the murder should ever stop, or the music should ever cease, somehow you sense that Perry Mason and Raymond Burr will always be there. The saga is not ended yet.